Once again, geology enthusiast, we are back for another exciting episode on fossils and the fossil record. So let's get started. To review, we talked about fossil preservation. And what we learned was it's pretty hard to become incorporated into the fossil record. And so less than 10% of life that we find on the planet becomes incorporated. And so we're really kind of chasing that idea of geologic gap. So we said, if the cat is pink, does that mean the cat has ever been white? And what that really means is just because we've found an abundance of pink cats, that does not mean that we can't find a, a white cat. Maybe it has been eroded. Maybe there's been an unconformity. Maybe it's too deep to uh, access. Um, so that makes geology, especially like thinking in terms of the fossil record, pretty exciting because we're intentionally trying to fill in those gaps and we're learning as we do. And sometimes um, things that we thought were true, like we came up with a, we, the scientific community, come up with a hypothesis. We find evidence to suggest and support a hypothesis, but sometimes we find new discoveries that debunk that. And for sure, that makes it uh, super exciting. Um, when we also talked about fossil preservation, we said that we needed to focus on sedimentary types of rocks. So although we made examples of like the massive eruption of Pompeii burying the ancient city with volcanic ash, we talked about the ash fall, fossil beds in, in Nebraska. Um, most of the time when we focus on the fossil record, we're focusing on sedimentary type of rocks because they are characteristic of environments of deposition of where organisms live, vertebrates and invertebrates. And so those best trap the signatures of fossils that we are trying to discover. Uh, the next thing we talked about is modes of preservation. And we said that they're limited on five different characteristics. So we talked about time and rate of burial. So how quickly something becomes buried is going to be an asset um, lots of times, if it's buried quickly, the entire skeleton will be um, preserved. Uh, we talked about the abundance of the population, and we made comparisons, again, between invertebrates and vertebrates, and said that invertebrate populations are more statistically abundant than our vertebrate populations, and so we have a better, um, a better understanding of them, I think, largely, that, that would be true. Um, we said durability of hard parts is important. So things that are bones, structures that are more durable are going to more likely make it into the fossil record. We used example of teeth and ribs and metatarsals. Um, things that don't preserve well include lower jaws, um, fibias and tibias, radius and ulnas. So the more delicate structures within uh, a vertebrate skeleton are less likely to make it into the fossil record. And so we have to account for those things either by piecing together skeletons from a variety of different ones or anticipating what we think they might look like. And uh, we always have to ask the question, how did the organism die? And we just want to know if it, um, if it died quickly or if it had uh, something wrong with it that caused it to die over a period of time. And so that's gonna influence what we find in the fossil record. So if it died quickly at the surface, then it might've been scavenged and pulled apart. If it died slowly um, from natural causes, maybe it hid in a cave or something. And so we're able to find the entirety of the skeleton. So, um, so I think that gave us a really good precursor to discuss the types of fossilization that we find and there's variability. Um, and there's variability based on what we're trying to fossilize in the first place. So the definition of a fossil is one that is an organic remain. And, um, and so that is going to be uh, physical structures um, that we would like to see. And so how we trap those are going to depend on the type of fossilization. On your screen, you have um, five different ones that we're going to explore today. So the first one is unaltered remains of bone shells or soft parts. The second one 
is petrication, recrystallization, and we're gonna find out how those are different, carbonization, impressions, and molds and casts. So um, again, to remind you, by definition, a fossil is the evidence of a organic material at the substance. So organic means something that was once living. So it's not just limited to vertebrates and invertebrates, we can also talk in terms of, of plants. All right, let's continue. We'll tease these out. We're gonna start with my very favorite, okay? I just love this so much. So our first is unaltered preservation of bone and shell. So what that means is and usually what this is tied to is a very quick paced of time and rate of burial. And in our last discussion, we used the example of the La Brea tar pits in California. And so here are some great examples of images that you find. On the left is the woolly mammoth, and on the right is a saber-toothed tiger. And so their great demise came when they fell into these tar pits and, um, and died, but um, what beautiful preservation. So in this instance, we're looking at the remains of bone and shell. So you're seeing the true skeletal features of these organisms as they once lived. So these are, are young, and so they have, um, they have not been replaced by other minerals, and so we can still see evidence of carbon in them. So remember, the limitation on carbon-14 dating is that it only goes back about 50, 1,000 years. The La Brea tar pit is an example of where these bones are younger than that. So we can, um, we can use carbon-14 dating and we can see the actual remnants of bone that has not gone through decay or replacement. Uh, the next is uh, amber. So, you, you might have been to any like uh, art festival and like, look at the jewelry and there's always amber jewelry for sale. It's relatively inexpensive. Um, if you look close at some of that amber, you might be able to see evidence of bugs or frogs or crickets or insects, other insects trapped within that amber. So amber is essentially just um, uh, sap that moves out of a tree. So you can see that, especially with the transition of, of uh, going into fall. Um, like maple syrup, like the sugars produce uh, this uh, sticky substance that can uh, solidify into amber. So amber is uh, the hard when it crystallizes. And amber coming out of a tree can often incorporate insects or frogs into it. So you may be familiar with the original Jurassic Park, and that's the premise of the movie, isn't it? So the scientists um, find a mosquito that's trapped in the amber, and they say, well, the amber, um, the mosquito in the amber has the dinosaur DNA, right? Because mosquitoes um, bite vertebrates, and so they have the blood of the, the dinosaurs. Um, the truth is, as evidenced by the images on the screen, insects like mosquitoes can for sure get trapped and you can for sure see their hard parts. Um, the problem with extracting dinosaur DNA is that amber itself is organic and so it's going to go through um, physical breakdown. So it's going to physically decompose. And so you're never going to be able to find some amber that dates back 66 million years ago to the age of the dinosaurs. But it's a great movie, for sure. Um, yeah, so this is an example, again, of unaltered heart parts because you can physically encase the frog, the insect, whatever gets trapped by the amber in case. So it gives us a very good clue of things that were once living on the planet and think how important um, insects are and think how important it is to um, to understand insects if you don't have a, a means of 
finding them in the fossil record like amber. The next is called permineralization. So usually when we refer to permineralization, we're referring to, um, to wood. We're usually referring to wood. Bones and teeth can go through permineralization, but it's less likely. We'll talk about a different process where we focus on. But you may have heard of petrified wood. You might have been to the petrified wood forest in Arizona. It's fantastic. If you've ever held a piece of um, petrified wood, what you'll notice is that it's really heavy. Like it's a really very much a dense piece of, of structure. So what happens in this case is that you have that piece of wood that's completely carbon, right? It's organic. It's living. It eventually dies and falls on the earth's surface. When it comes in contact with water, and that water might be rain, that water might be groundwater, it might fall into a lake, the carbon itself is replaced by minerals that are in the water. So remember that like when you drink water and taste water, that there's minerals in it. There's calcium, there's fluoride, there's, um, there's salts, and they're at, at at very low parts per million, but they're present. And so what happens is when the wood comes in contact with that water, the minerals are going to precipitate out. So it's replacing the structure that was once there. And so you're then able to see a very distinct image of what that would look like because the internal structures are being replaced as they are adhered to by the, by the minerals. And so essentially what's happening is that material is going to turn into a solid rock. Um, taking us back to carbon dating techniques then, when uh, we said that the maximum age of which carbon-14 dating can be used is about 50,000 years. And so beyond 50,000 years, we can look to other dating techniques of, of petrified wood because it's been replaced by minerals. So you can use potassium argon dating as an example to date trees that are much older than 50,000 years. Um, and again, too, if it is a hardwood tree, just like see, you see on the screen here, um, if it was a really good sample, which there are, you can still physically count the age of how old that tree was when it died, because you just date the, you just physically count the, the years. And so that could be, um, pretty valuable if you're trying to reconstruct what an ancient forest might have looked like. So then the variability in color of petrified wood is from, is from the uh, different types of minerals. Um, remembering that an abundance of the petrified wood is gonna be silica rich, so SiO2 or quartz, and remembering that there's variability in the color of that quartz. So here's just a picture of, um, of the petrified forest in Arizona. I hope that you get to go there one day. Okay, then we can talk about recrystallization. So recrystallization is specific to, um, to bones and teeth. And lots of times when we're dealing with the invertebrate record, where we're looking at clams or shells or um, these things that are called brachiopods, um, different types of mollusks, usually what happens is instead of going through permineralization, they go through recrystallization. So remember that um, we're thinking in terms of these like shallow marine environments where these clams and mollusks and brachiopods are, are all living. And so they're making their outer shell cavity out of calcium that's in the water column. So upon death, what can happen is that they can, their shells can recrystallize as they're still in contact with that water column. So it's a process that's sometimes referred to as aggregation, where your calcium is being replaced by magnesium. It depends on the temperature of the, of the water, but essentially the calcium is replaced or recrystallized into 
a um, into a different mineral. And so it has to do with uh, replacement and like a chemical exchange that happens in the water column. So if you if you look at um, one of these specimens, they appear to still be calcium rich, but they've gone through this recrystallization and it makes them a little bit more dense. And that's usually happens with bones or teeth. And our next is carbonization. And in the carbonization technique, you are dealing with plants that are going through a decay process. And not all plants, but some plants have a, a substance within them, a compound within them that's called chelatin. And so chelatin can stain the surface. And in these two examples of ferns, the ferns were laying on top of the rock and as they go through the decomposition, they, they produce that chelatin and it stains the surface. So the plant itself, the plant structure itself is gone, but you've stained the surface to allow us to be able to have a visual representation of what the plant might look like. And um, in, in some cases, these are in such great detail that you can even tell the genus and species of the plants. So it's a really um, fantastic way to understand the natural environment. And the next is thinking in terms of impressions. And we've done a little bit with this when we've talked about sedimentary structures. And it gives you evidence of past life. So whether we're talking in terms of, of tracks or trailways, um, an impression is left on the, on the surface. Uh, additionally, you could think in terms of how plants could be compacted onto the surface. So let's say that you're in a, um, an environment where there might be mud and you might have, um, you might have a piece of plant that falls onto the surface and gets a little bit impacted. Eventually it will completely decay but you're left with the impression of the plant. So it's a little bit different than carbonization because you're just looking at the structure and there's no staining. Here we're looking at impressions of pteropods on the left and then impressions of worm burrows. So some of our very first evidence of life is going to be from these trace fossils. We also call these trace fossils, these in, impressions. So it's a trace of the, of um, of a sign of life that was once on the planet. Here's some evidence of bird tracks. So you can look to see their, um, their impressions of their feet as they walked on the, on the surface. And the last one is usually the most trickiest to identify, and that's really asking the question as to if it's a mold or a cast. And so when we look at the picture on the left, you're looking at a mold and that is gonna represent an external impression. So the depression itself is concave. And then on the right, you're looking at a cast. A cast and an internal mold um, represent really the same type of thing by definition. An eternal mold forms when sediment infills a shell or skeleton. Um, oftentimes what can happen is you have a shell, so we're thinking in terms of a clam, and the clam is living and then eventually will die. Well, the shell still remains, but it gets infilled with sediment. And so the exterior of the shell will decay, but you're left with an idea of the internal structure of what is left and that's called an internal mold. And oftentimes that can tell us uh, even more than just having a concave impression because we look to see what the interior components of some of the, these bivalves are. And so you can tell something about the genus and species because that's how they're classified by their internal hinge. And we can often see that. Um, and then a cast is just seeing the, the raised impressions. So you're seeing the relief of what that interior mold looks like. Here's another example of an internal mold.
And so those are just different ways that we can begin to think about and classify different types of fossils. So whether we're asking the question of on altered hard parts, if they have been petrified, if they've been recrystallized, if there is carbonization, or if they're in impression. So we use those as like a big way to, to discern different types of fossils. Um, another way that we like to use fossils in the fossil record is to make correlations um, in stratigraphy. So again, back to good old Nicholas Ditto, father of stratigraphy, 1600s, um, initiating some of those uh, original laws of horizontality, superposition, lateral continuity. Now we can build on that with the fossil correlation. And remember from the last lecture, Nicholas Steno was certainly interested in trying to do this with the fossils that he was finding. So um, by definition, and we've talked a little bit about this when we talked about Alfred Wegener and his ideas of continental drift and how he was trying to match up those continents, he was looking for index fossils, Glossopolis terrace, Mosasaur, Lysosaur, and and by definition, an index fossil then follows these four different characteristics. They have a short evolutionary lifespan. They are geographically widespread. They are well-preserved and easily identifiable. So a most common type of index fossil is called a trilobite. And I'll show you some pictures of that. So a, an index fossil is going to be able to um, link us from location A to location B because they're geographically widespread. So if I find an, an index fossil in Rome, Georgia, like a trilobite, which I'll show you a picture of, a trilobite is a trilobite is a trilobite. There's nothing else that we have found to date in the fossil record that looks like a trilobite. There can be different genus and species. They can be different sizes, but it is, um, it is, easily identifiable and very unique. The trilobite lives, we see the first example of the trilobite in the Cambrian, and it goes extinct in the Permian. So death and destruction will kill the trilobite never to be seen on the planet again. Trilobite is geographically widespread, is found in limestone in shallow marine environments. So it's living in a constrained um, location and it is in a specific type of environment that's geographically widespread. So if nothing else, if I find a trilobite in Rome, Georgia, which doesn't happen frequently, but it's possible. So if I locate a trilobite here and I go to Europe and I find a trilobite in Ireland, I can know without knowing anything else, I know that it lives in a shallow marine environment and that the age of that rock is constrained to being from the Cambrian to the Permian. So anywhere from 570 million years ago to about 248 million years ago. So I've narrowed down the age of that rock without even knowing any other geology of the area. And that's because an index fossil is unique. And they're well, pre and they're well preserved. And so um, because trilobite did live in a shallow marine environment. They're the one of the first things to uprise in the fossil record in the Cambrian. They're statistically abundant. So you can easily find them in the fossil record in specific locations. And I'm just gonna talk a little bit more about the chart that's on the screen relating to the trilobite. This is a diversity called the diversity index diagram. Um, over here on the left, you have ages from oldest to youngest, so upper Precambrian to the Quaternary, modern time, and then on the top of the diagram, you have different types of, um, of species. So trilobite is on there, but there's a variety of different types of species. And what you're looking at is the thick bar represents worldwide correlation, a dash represents local correlation, and then the thin line represents no correlation. So we're going to be looking at these uh, as we start to discuss the fossil record because we want to be able to know if they're abundant um, and if they're present with a worldwide signature.
Also, the purpose of looking for index fossils is to identify something that's called a fossil assemblage. So, and you should write this down. Um, like assemblages or groups of fossils that are of similar age, those assemblages are of the same age. So it's kind of like asking who came to the party. So when we when we look at um, at a fossil of a piece of limestone, what we begin to notice is that there's different types of things trapped in that piece of limestone. There's clams, there's mollusks, there's brachiopods. And what we know is that they were all living in the same environment at the same time that they died. They drank the Kool-Aid at the party, apparently. But so there's brachiopods, there's, there's clams, there's mollusks, and they're all a fossil assemblage because they were all living in that environment at the same time and also died in the environment at the same time. So it gives us a scope of, um, of the environment of which they were living, like they must have needed to live in similar conditions. So again, it helps us to tease out the climate. And then additionally, we can use that to make correlations. So you're looking to see um, the time period of when these different groups lived. And so when we look at the diagram that's on the screen, we're trying to correlate um, one area over on the left to the area over on the right. You're asking to find like the groups that were living at the same time. And we find on the second area that we find group B as a fossil assemblage and group C. And so that group A must be the unconformity. So it helps you to confine the ages of the, of the rocks by understanding these different assemblages. So I think I'm gonna stop here for today and, um, and we're gonna begin to explore the fossil and fossil record um, starting at Precambrian time. So we'll use these tools that we've developed within these past couple lectures. Have a great day.